Matthew 18, 20, this is what Jesus says. He says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. I don't know if that soaked in enough. Let me say it again. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Uh, There's something special, there's something powerful about when God's people come together in biblical community. And as we're going to talk about today in Romans 12.10, it's in this idea of being together and loving one another that we as the church, as you as the youth group, as you as God's individuals can, number one, you reach your max potential. Number two, we fulfill our purpose. Uh, A few years ago, not few, maybe about 10 or 12, there's a movie that came out called Castaway. And uh, in this movie, there's a guy named Chuck Nolan. He plays, of course, by Tom Hanks. Uh, Chuck Nolan, of course, is on this airplane. He's a well-known FedEx executive. And the plane crashes, and he finds himself along with some luggage, some packages, and himself all alone on this uninhabited island. But the main story is not really how Chuck is hungry, Or how Chuck is thirsty. And although he's on this island for 1,500 days, the main story is Chuck is lonely. In fact, Chuck is craving a human relationship so much that he even gets this volleyball that becomes his imaginary friend named Wilson. Now, I pray and hope that your loneliness never gets to that level. But what that tells us is this. We as humans, we were created for community. And and you should not be shocked that you desire to have relationships with other people. God Himself lived in community, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You weren't meant to do life alone. You were meant to do life together. A, A massive storm started to rise on a sea. And there was this ship that was caught right in the middle of the storm. It was tossing the ship back and forth and back and forth. And the captain was doing as best as he could to control his ship. It got to the point the waves got so massive it broke the holes. The water became washing onto the decks. And as the water was on the decks, the water started sweeping sailor after sailor after sailor into the sea. The captain, as he was steering the ship, is literally doing as best as he possibly can to keep order, to keep control, to rescue as many sailors as he possibly can that have fallen overboard. Not long after, that captain, the ship, and a few sailors he rescued, they find themselves on this island. And so he drags them there and he gets out on the shore and he said, guys, what I want you to do is this. I want you to camp out on this island for a little bit. See, because I know there's more sailors that are out there. Maybe they're hanging out and and holding on to some driftwood, but i got to go back and rescue them. So here's what I want you to do. There's some trees over there, and I want you to get those trees, and I want you to build a fire so tall. And I want you to build this fire so tall that, number one, it will keep you warm because it's soon going to get cold. But number two, I want you to build this fire so that way, when I go back out to sea, I'll know where to come back and to rescue you. And so the people, those sailors that were on the island were no doubt happy. They were grateful. I mean, they had been rescued. They could have been lost. They could have been dead. So they find themselves on this island. But guess what? As soon as that gracious attitude came in, it soon left. As we usually do, we get kind of sick of one another. We start to crawl under each other's skin. And what turned into gratitude then gave way to frustration. So they said, well, maybe now's the time. It's time to build that fire because we've been waiting for day after day after day and there's no sign of this guy. And they couldn't see the captain anywhere off in the distance, so they start to get some of the wood to build this fire. They grab some of the cypress trees and and they're putting them here in this huge fire and, and there's some other guys grabbing some cypress trees and they're putting them in the fire. Some other guys start to grab some brush and they start to put in the fire. And and the guys that are grabbing the cypress trees say, No, 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 whoa, whoa. What are you guys doing with that brush? He didn't say anything about putting brush into this fire. He, when, when he was saying, what I want you to do is get those trees, he was pointing in the direction of just the cypress trees. He didn't say anything about the brush. And so the group then debated. They discussed. But it then gave way to division. And there was two groups then on the island. The trees only group and the trees mostly group. Things were peaceful for a while on the north end and the south end of the island. It came time to start another fire. 
the trees only group began to collect some more cypress trees. They took them down and they put them in a pile. They took another one down and they put it in a pile. Another guy grabbed an oak tree and he put it in the pile. And they're like, whoa, whoa, why are you bringing an oak tree into this fire? See, because when he was pointing at the trees, the direction that he was pointing was actually in the direction of the cypress trees. Why in the world are you bringing oak tree into this fire? Well, one of the guys spoke up and said, man, that, are you not noticing that there are no cypress trees hardly left? And then also, oak is the main tree on this island. The main task that we were given was just to build this fire tall. So the group split. The cypress only group and the oaks only group. Things weren't getting much better on the south end of the island. They get those trees and the brush and they start piling it high. The group began to debate about how tall that fire really should be. One group said, don't build it too tall because it'll fall over and it'll cause a bigger fire. The other group said, well, it has to be tall enough or how in the world are we going to be rescued? So the captain of the ship looks off in the distance. He sees four pillars of smoke on that island. He shakes his head and laughs. You know, it won't take you much time to spend within the church and in this world to notice that there are a whole lot of fires on the island. And here's the problem. There's no purpose. There's no intention. It's all about selfishness. It's all about forcing tradition to be doctrine. It's all about attitude. It's all about a stubborn behavior. We sometimes forget the purpose is to build the fire as tall as we possibly can. I don't care if it's cypress. I don't care if it's oak. I don't think God really even cares if there's some brush involved. He just wants that fire to be as tall as it possibly can. You know, I think sometimes we don't fully grasp and get that our tendency to divide how costly it can be for the church. See, because when you divide and you aren't truly devoted to one another and each other's needs, it, number one, it distracts you as the believer. It, it distracts you from what's really important. See, when you're on the inside arguing about air conditioning, PowerPoint, padded pews, non-padded pews, all the while there's a group of people out there that are lost and dying. And, and why in the world would someone want to move from one storm to another storm? If they're living in a storm in their school, are they going to move to a storm in a youth group? And not only does it distract us as believers from what's important, but number two, it discourages the seeker. I mean, why are they going to want to come and be a part of you? It's like some overweight gentleman trying to sell vitamins. Are you going to buy those things? And not only this, we forget so many times, folks, unity was Jesus Christ's idea. And, and by us not being unified, by us not being devoted to one another, you are literally slapping Jesus in the face. Jesus, right before his death, encountered this in two ways. His apostles were arguing. They were bickering about, you know, which one of us is going to be the greatest? Which one of us is going to have the best seat? And Jesus prayed this prayer to his father. He said, Father, this is what I'm praying more than anything, that I want them to experience oneness like we experience oneness. And he said, and it's in that that they will know that you sent me. If you don't listen to anything else I say tonight, please listen to this. It's not about your programs as great as they may be. It's not even about the Super Saturday as awesome as it may be. It's not even about your vacation Bible school as awesome as that may be. He said, that's not where people are going to know that I have been sent by the Heavenly Father. He said, it's in whether or not you are unified. And, and so what I want to do for the next few minutes is I want you to open your mind and to really understand this true prescription for unity and, and what it really looks like to be devoted to one another, the first thing I want you to understand is you have to accept one another. This is a big deal in Romans. If you look in Romans chapter 14, it starts in verse 19. Paul makes this urge to the people. He says, I want you to make every effort to be at peace with one another. Now, that's what your Bibles say. 
But if you actually go to the original Greek, this is what it says. I want you to make every effort and keep on making every effort. What's that saying? That unity is not something that you just arrive at and you walk away from. Unity is a constant work in progress. You are going to have to constantly stop making sure that you are selfish. You are going to have to stop making sure that it's not all about your needs and not all about your wants. What I'm saying is you have to constantly, constantly be on guard. Because then he flips over to the very next chapter in verse 7. And he says, so this is what I want you to do. In order as you make every effort, I want you to accept one another as Christ accepts you. See what they were arguing about wasn't trees mostly or trees only. They were talking about food. Can we eat this food or can we not eat this food? Paul's like, you have missed it. You have missed the main point. It's not about the food. It's it's about your message that you are sending. You are dividing amongst yourselves over issues that literally do not matter. What you're doing is you're making your wants, those selfish things, those traditions, you're making them law, you're making them fact when you have no room whatsoever to do such a thing. And and who are we anyway to not accept one another? What makes you so great? What makes me so great? I think about the woman that went up to her husband. She said, hey, I was on Craigslist and I saw that this person was giving away a free monkey and, 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 and I, you know I've wanted a monkey for so long. He said, no, 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 we're not bringing a monkey in our house. She said, please, you know I've wanted one. He goes, well, well let me ask you this. Is this monkey going to hang out in our house? She said, yeah. Well, well is this monkey going to hang out in our living room? Yeah. I mean, I get, well, I'm guessing it's going to sit at our table. Yeah. Is the thing going to sleep in our bed? Yeah. But that thing is going to stink. She said, well, I've lived with you for years. I'm sure I can live with this monkey for a while. You know, I think sometimes we can be so focused on everybody else's stench that we miss our own sometimes. And so instead of getting hot, instead of disputing, uh, I don't want us to get caught up in opinions. I want us to get caught up in Jesus and to build that fire so high. I want you to notice in this passage it says that I want you to accept one another is what Paul says, but he doesn't stop there. There's no period after it. He said, I want you to accept one another as Jesus Christ accepts you. So who are you not to scoot over and make more room on the pew? Who are you not to add someone else to the circle? See, you think about Jesus in John 14, 2. This word accept is a powerful verb because this is what Jesus says. This is the same type of acceptance that I'm going to give you one day when you're standing in front of me. And I am going to be the one that decides whether you make it in this pearly kingdom or not. This is the same thing that Paul is telling Philemon in Philemon 17. He's saying, listen, I want you to accept Philemon. This verb accept means to bring into your heart. We're talking about a deep, a meaningful relationship. I'm not just talking about living under the same roof, guys. I'm not just saying that I just invited him. I've tried to include them. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about establishing a good, heartfelt relationship. There's a Marine that right after World War II was surveying the scene after the bomb that went in Japan. And as he was looking at that, day after day, was surveying the scene, he got to a point in his uh, time there that he needed a place to worship on Sunday. He walked into a Japanese church, and of course, as you can imagine, there was a little distance to begin with. But he said what was amazing was this. What started started out as distance, what started out as division, was gone away when that Lord's Supper tray was passed around. See, there's a story within that story. The cross can do what you guys can't. You may not be able to undo 2,000 years of division, of bickering, fighting, getting caught up in opinions, preferences, but you can make an effort right now to place an extremely high premium on unity. So let's accept one another. The second thing is this. 
is we have to be faithful to one another. Uh, George Barna wrote a book called What Americans Believe, and he says every American is lucky if they have five faithful friends. Five faithful friends. And he says it's not the reason because we're such an individualistic society. He said it really doesn't even have anything to do with media. It doesn't even have anything to do with our cell phones. It really doesn't even have anything to do with our computers. He says the reason why people are retreating to cell phones and computers and in this cyber world is because people that are going to be there in thick and thin, that are trustworthy, that are real, are super hard to come by these days. That's why so many of us are attracted to shows where you see people in what we imagine as real, caring, sensitive, heartfelt relationships. That's why I love the story of Jonathan and David. I want you to imagine growing up, you are expecting to be king. It's your right. You've inherited it. You've lived under the king your whole life. No doubt Jonathan had pictures of him in, on that throne. That scepter in his hand, that crown on his head, the long red robe. I know he pictured it all. And I'm sure he pictured the reformation that he's about to instill. The things that he didn't like about his father reign, he's going to flip it around. But guess who comes on the scene? A guy named David and changes it all. This guy Jonathan was so excited about coming king that David comes around and not only are they pushing his dad aside by saying, yeah, Saul's killed his thousands, but this guy David, he's killed his tens of thousands. You guys just wait till he becomes king. We would be bitter. We would be jealous. We would try whatever we could do to distance ourselves from David. Jonathan accepts David and not only accepts David, but he's faithful to David. See, because David's nervous. Saul's about to kill him. And, and in verse 4 of this chapter, this is what happens in 1 Samuel 20. He says, David, excuse me, Jonathan, what I'm going to need is this. I, I'm going to need you to be here for me during this difficult time. It would have been at that time most of us would say, good luck. But he says, whatever you need, I will do. Let me tell, ask you, do you have any friends like that? Do you have any what I call Galatians 6 friends that will bear your burdens? Do you have those relationships that are truly devoted to each other? They're hard to come by. But here's the other side of the thing that Jonathan said, yeah, I'll be there for you, but David, I want you to understand there's another side of this friendship as well that I'm going to need you to be there for me too, see, because I know you're going to be king one day. And there's going to come a time when you're king that my family is going to be need and want. And so I'm going to need you to show my family, and this is the word, it says unfailing kindness. That, that, that Hebrew word is like our Greek word for agape. It's hasid, which means uh, sovereign, enduring, patient. He said, that's what I'm going to need from you during this difficult time. See, what you have to get is there are two sides to every relationship. It's not just about you receiving the friendship. It's about you giving the friendship. It's not you talking about being loyal. It's you about actually being loyal. Are you truly being faithful to one another? But the final thing, that if we're going to be devoted to one another, is we have to speak life to one another. I want you right now to think of the five most powerful voices that are in your life right now. What are the five voices that you surround yourself with the most? And I'll show you the direction of your life. See, David was sick and tired of hiding from Saul. He was out in the desert wondering. And here's what's awesome. Jonathan knows that Saul's about to kill him. You know what Jonathan doesn't do? Man, that stinks. Good luck. He goes to find him. See, good friends always ex just show up for one another. See, when you show up for your friend, maybe it's at a coffee shop, maybe it's at school, maybe it's at work, maybe it's calling someone aside at church, this is what it does. Not only does it show them that you're there, but it reminds them that God is there. And so he not only does he show up, but he speaks life to him. And here's the amazing thing. He didn't say anything elaborate. He didn't say anything great. He re actually just reminded David of everything that he already knew. He said, I want you to find strength in God and I want you to have courage. 
And so he did. And whenever I think of this account, it really breaks my heart that Saul and Jonathan both had to die, mainly Jonathan. But because I wonder that right after David committed adultery with Bathsheba, I seriously think that his sin would have stopped right there if Jonathan was still around. Because he would have had someone faithful to go to. Man, let me tell you, I messed up and I messed up big. And instead of spinning his web of deception and lies, I seriously think he would have gone to Jonathan. They would have talked it out, had a broken time of repentance and confession and made things right before the Lord. See, you have to surround yourself with people like this that are not just faithful one minute and not the next, but are truly people that will be by your side. See, there's a lot of mentors out there. There's a lot of coaches. While those are good and needed at times, you need people that are going to ride right beside you. You need people that will do life together. Jesus was kind of, I guess you could say, put on the spot. They were trying to catch him. They were trying to see if he could slip up, and they said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus knew that this is not a good time to just be vague. Yeah, there's 600 and something commands, but I'm going to boil it down to this. I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And so don't you think, as Peter said, that love covers a multitude of sins? That don't you think Uh, That if love can cover your nasty, your horrible, your sin that you wish so bad you could go back and undo, that it won't cover your problem with division? See, I love what Scripture talks about when it talks about truly being devoted to one another. It says this, that you aren't to just love by feeling things. 1 Corinthians 13 doesn't say, I want you to feel patient. And I want you to feel sad for that person that's alone. And and I want you to feel lonely for that person. He says, no, love does kind things. It feels patient things. It does. It it doesn't just feel, it acts. That's what James says in James 2. You see this guy chilling in the corner uh, with with no jacket. He's freezing and he's he's hungry. Do you say to this guy, man, I, I hate that you're cold, buddy. Well, be filled and be warm. You know, and then you walk away. He's saying, what good does that do? He said, the whole point is you're supposed to say, oh, you're cold? Here's a jacket. Oh, you're hungry? Give him something. You don't just love by word, but you love by doing. But not only is is love active, I want you also to understand that you are called to love other people that do not love you back. You gravitate towards people all the time that you just share common interests with. That's not necessarily bad, but the problem is so many times we put so much energy in just the people that we're comfortable with that we have no room left over for anyone else. The relationships that we have on this earth, there's not supposed to be strings attached. It's not about being selective. As we close, I want to remind you who we are in that parable. Jesus, of course, was the captain of that ship. We went overboard. He was rescuing us as fast as possibly as he could, and he has placed us here on this earth to do good things. And you have the job, you have the task, you have the opportunity of building a fire so high. So I pray for you that your devotion is seen as we've talked about today in your worship. And when you get out of the bed in the morning, I pray you don't just roll out of the bed and walk into the foyer, step foot into an auditorium, clock in, clock out. I pray that your worship is heartfelt, it's meaningful, it's God-centered and it's Bible-based. And I pray too that you will start to see people differently than you've ever seen them before. It's no longer co-workers, friends, and families. It's souls that are lost. And I pray that you'll also see people differently. You'll stop being exclusive. You'll stop 
giving a friendship to someone with a string attached to it. There's no middle ground in this devotion. In fact, Jesus says that He wants to spew out that middle ground. Jesus says, you're either attached to Me or you're not. I'm not talking about one foot in the soil, one foot out. I am the vine, you are the branches. Let's be devoted. Let's pray. God, we thank You so much for this day that You've blessed us with and this awesome opportunity we've had to come together and to open our minds to Your Word and the truth that it gives us. And God, You're so good to us and You've blessed us in so many ways. And sometimes I think we get caught up in forgetting uh, all the blessings that You give us. And we try to create things and and to make man-made things where You've already made, Lord. And we try to fix things that You've already fixed. And Lord, I ask that You be with us and help us to be humble enough to submit to You and Your will. Lord, You've already figured everything out. Help us to adopt your will and to adopt your way. And Lord, I ask that you be with us as we depart from this place. Help us to not be so self-deceived that we don't think we have a problem or that we don't need to fix something that needs to be fixed. Help us to make a decision right now to grow closer to you and your Son. And we ask all these things in your Son's name. Amen.